Good morning, hacksters! It is Tuesday m Oh! I'm not actually sure that this went live because it's yelling at me. No, we are live. Sorry. <laughs> Happy Tuesday. Uh, it is my favorite day of the week. We have Hackster Cafe, and this week we are talking to Dr. Carlotta A. Berry, who is an amazing person who is just like a shining star in the world of robotics education and you have many credentials including your professor uh, if i'm not mistaken of electrical and computer engineering at rose holman institute of technology yes. and you've written books multiple uh -huh. types of books which i would love to dig into yeah, yeah. i uh, love to talk about my books <laughs> and you go by uh nora steminist and have also founded black and robotics and black and engineering and just the list goes on and on, but first up, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I am doing wonderful. How are you? So good. Uh, yeah. So where to start? Uh, could you tell us about um, your work at Rose Holman? Absolutely. I'll start there. Um, I have been at Rose Holman since 2006, so I'm dating myself a little bit. <laughs> and I am actually an electrical engineer, but my department is electrical and computer engineering. But the cool thing about what I do is because I do robotics, which is multidisciplinary, I work with students from other departments just as much as I work with electrical and computer engineering students. Ooh. So I teach circuits, control, signals and systems mobile robotics, advanced mobile robotics, human robot interaction. And sometimes my robotics classes actually have more mechanical engineering students or computer science and software engineering students than my own students. So I like to say I just cross the line. I teach it all. <laughs> Do you think it, that there's some kind of cool cross pollination between the students of different disciplines? Absolutely. And I preach a lot about that. And be, me being in robotics, it makes it easy to do that because mm. I will tell them you will do a whole lot better in my classes if you're on a team of somebody with somebody from another major. Because if coding is not your jam, then you better get on a project with that CS student and you work on the sensors and electronics because hardware may not be their jam. Mm. So multidisciplinary work is key to robotics. So I get to see that every day in my classes. And I think it's great. Nice. Uh, and so you have uh, your main website is Nora Steminist. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So that started during the pandemic. I went on sabbatical mm. right around the beginning of the pandemic. And my friend had always been like, there are not enough academics on social media. We do some really cool stuff and it should not be isolated to our campuses and our classrooms. And so I started sharing a lot of my robotics and engineering content. And people mm. love this stuff, especially on Twitter and my Twitter quizzes. So I came up with that name only because I could not find a way to describe someone who is a STEMinist, but also I like to promote seeing more brown and black people in STEM. Mm. And I didn't like black STEMinists. And so I had seen Noir somewhere else and I know I, I can't speak French, so I'm saying it wrong. And so I, I put hashtag Noir STEMinist on all my stuff because it was a pain finding it. So my original <laughs> reason for doing it is so that I could go search this hashtag that was really oh. rare and pull my content back up when I wanted to see it. And then eventually after a year or so and the popularity grew and people were asking me for things like books and workshops and whatnot. Yeah. I was like, this has got to be a business, but I have to have a name that I can trademark. And this one worked. <laughs> well, it suits you perfectly. Okay. And uh, oh my gosh. Okay, so you also have, just for people who are following along, you can find all these links in the description below. Uh, we've got your Instagram, we've got your Twitter, where you talked about doing quizzes. And one, one thing that I've noticed about seeing your presence online is that you have this wonderful set of GIFs that is like your own reaction GIFs with your own uh, <laughs> face on them and stuff. I think that's so cool. So I can tell you about that too. Yeah. Everything I did was so organic. Nothing is planned, no branding, no marketing, none of that. I'm a professor. And what irritated me was every time I wanted to react to something, I'd have to do a death scroll to find a brown or black face. Oh. Or just like when you Google engineer, you got to go hunting to find a brown or black engineer or professor. So I originally just did it because I was like, I want to, to type robotics engineer and see a brown face show up. Or I want to type professor and see mm. a woman show up. And then after a while, I became addicted to making gifts. And now <laughs> it has just exploded and I went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And it's so relevant because that also plays into how our AIs get trained, you know, as we move into this area where, yeah, where like robots and stuff are trained on human yeah. interactions in the social space. You know, if that's not appearing in your GIF selection, it's not going to appear in the, uh, you know, what the, the robots are trained on and stuff. 
Absolutely. I give talks on that um, where, where we talk about that, you know, bias in AI. And I've given talks on this as well, where mm. I believe it was um, Amazon or Google. I, I hate to misquote, but one of them had made an AI that would pull out resumes for people they should interview. And then they yeah. were like, what is going on? It's pulling out all these white males. And it's because it was matching it to their current workforce. Mm -hmm. Right. And so people have to look at the data that they're using to train their AI or the AI is no good. Right. And so yeah. there, that's bias. And that there was another one, the Twitter um, images that were highly pixelated and they were all being corrected to white males like right. images of Barack Obama and all that. So once again, it goes, you know, you can't just champion and say AI is the be all and end all without looking at, hey, if there's bias in the data, there's bias in the AI. That ain't mm -hmm. going to work. <laughs> I remember that one. Yeah, it's like a, a technology where it's uh, supposed to increase the resolution sort of magically with data with technology. And it's like it's not increasing the resolution based on like because there's no. There, there's no underlying data you can pull out. It's no just kind like of logical to... yeah, connection. And it, th I think the worst part about it, and I talk about this as well, is why does it have to go live for that to be exposed? Mm -hmm. Are you telling me there was nobody in house who ran this stuff? It was like, hey, something ain't right. Why does it have to get on Twitter for you to get all embarrassed for people to be mm -hmm. like, uh-uh, there's something going on here. But that's when I also say you got to have multidisciplinary teams. You have to have diverse teams because if everybody in your shop looks exactly like the stuff that is biased mm -hmm. towards, then there's nobody in there that goes, something's not right here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh and you talked a lot about affirmative action and the benefits of having that in academia. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear uh, you mention that if you. I know that you have like various opinions on it. Okay, so uh, just to make it a little bit more specific, um, I was reading your feature in Reinvented Magazine, which is a great feature, mm -hmm. and uh, you talk about affirmative action and how some people view it as kind of a dirty word. Um, and it reminds me of something that I've come across recently, which is um, this concept of uh, imposter syndrome as something that's sort of like taking something that's very real in the environment where students, you know, still, uh, you mentioned in the article, you know, they're still having the experiences that you had at Georgia Tech in like 1993. Uh, and, you know, they're still experiencing these things. And uh, I've noticed that today we have this imposter syndrome concept. And it's sort of like shifting onto the individual, these natural responses to feeling like you're uh, visibly different from other people in your environment and that like there's a majority. And uh, it sort of takes that very natural, very real response to reality and turns it into like, oh, you have imposter syndrome. Like you are a problem and you need to get over it or something like that. I don't know. One thing I've thought about is this, that there's, there's some things that are a third rail, hmm. affirmative action, imposter syndrome, these are terms and things that I experienced and went through before I even knew what those terms meant. Mm. And so what I like to say is that I speak authentically to these experiences and what they mean to me. And I'm sorry if I'm not using the terms correctly or if they're now not politically correct. But I will say that I was probably a beneficiary of affirmative action and I believe in it. And I don't care whether mm. other people support it or not. And the way I think about it is we got folks out here um, pasting pictures of their child on the crew captain so that they can get their child in school. Mm -hmm. And until they got busted, we're doing that for years. And, you know, daddy donating to the library and getting yep. their child in school. And we thought that was OK. But if somebody said to me that having diversity in this classroom because diverse teams are more beneficial for everyone's learning experience is a bad thing, then you're not going to come at me with that. Mm. You can call it what you want, but having diversity in a classroom and diversity in your school, there are benefits for everyone in that Absolutely. classroom to learn from interacting with people from different and various demographic backgrounds. With respect to the imposter syndrome, like I said, I never knew what that was. All I know is I went in a classroom and saw one or two of me and always felt like even when I got awarded for things, I felt like I shouldn't be here. These people don't treat me like I should be here. And it feels a little bit like a mismatch. And one of the most interesting things that happened is even once I got my PhD, even with all the awards I've gotten mm -hmm. in the last five years, I still had a colleague come to me and go, I think you get a lot of this stuff because you're a black woman. Yeah. So, whoa, it doesn't stop just because you graduate from college or high school or your, get your PhD, there's still people walking around here who may be the beneficiary of things because as a white woman, mm -hmm. they may be given a pass because this person reminds them of their sister, their aunt, their daughter. And I have had a boss tell me that as well. You remind me a lot of my daughter and blah, blah, blah. 
and this was a white guy. Okay, first of all, I don't know you or your family, so <laughs> please don't project any of that onto me. Mm -hmm. So you can call it imposter syndrome. You can call it misogynoir. You can call it whatever you want. But there are some experiences that we have that are just not right. And maybe Absolutely. the term syndrome doesn't make sense because that does kind of feel like a, a ugly or nasty word. I'm more concerned with helping support these female black and brown students and make sure that they're able to navigate that nasty obstacle course and be successful. Right. So we can call it syndrome. We can call it whatever you want. But getting them over that other side is what's most important to me. Absolutely. And you've led multiple initiatives that really help with this. And I'd love to highlight some of the solutions that you've come up with, yeah. uh, like the Rosebud program. Yeah. Could you tell us about that? So a lot of things I don't do along. So um, the, the robotics minor at Rose Holman, I started with several colleagues in other departments and the Rosebud program is co-directed and was co-founded by Dr. Deborah Walter, a female faculty member in my department, and Dr. Shriram Mohan, who's a professor in computer science and software engineering. And that program was started because when I first got to Rose Holman, they had only been admitting women for about 20 years. So um, there were some years, the first couple of years I got there, that there would be no female students who went across the stage at commencement in electrical and computer engineering wow. and only a few brown or black students. So we started the program only because we wanted to encourage more students to consider electrical and computer engineering as majors. And now here we are over a decade later, Mm. And we have seen the numbers tick up. My school is now 25% women, nice. um, which is kind of the common national average in engineering. But we know some schools like Harvey Mudd, I just met somebody from there recently, have 50% women. So although we're the national average in engineering, there are some opportunities there. But we also expanded the program to computer science and software engineering. So what we have found is that electrical and computer engineering, computer science and software engineering, have the biggest challenges, not only with women, but for black and brown people. Um, computer science and software engineering is growing a little bit faster. But what I like to say is I think all of it is a marketing problem. And obviously I use robotics to try to help with that. But I think whatever your STEM jam is mm -hmm. and whatever you can do to marry um, and get more kids excited, we do that. With the programs like FIRST, I think yeah. that's bringing more kids into college, but they're going into mechanical engineering. So mm. I think something is happening where they're thinking robotics means mechanical engineering. Robotics has controls. It has controllers. This has human robot interaction. It hits on a lot of disciplines. So we got to do a better job of educating about what is robotics and how do you marry that? Because I think some of them are being mismatched to their skill sets by going into mechanical engineering because they're excited about robotics. Interesting. I've totally thought about, you know, I didn't, I didn't study, uh, engineering in college and I've totally thought about going back for some kind of like t actual technical degree and so so you think that uh should people study ECE or uh electrical engineering it depends right yeah. so so what I tell our students because like in our department electrical and computer engineering overlap a lot the mm -hmm. key difference is in the hardware but the mm -hmm. first couple of years it looks almost identical but then near the end of the second year they start to diverge where our computer engineering students will take computer architecture and but they look at more of the hardware side of electronics whereas we have computer science and software engineering students who look just you know purely at code and software development etc so what i ask students when they come to me and say i want a robotics minor is i say what excites you about the robot mm. do you want to write the controller do you want to talk about the brain do you want to wire up the electronics do you want to look at sensors how the robots communicate with each other or do you want to build it is it all about the kinematics and by doing that, that not only kind of tells me what major you should probably be in or what kind of track in robotics you should study. What, what excites you most about those things? What's your favorite part of robotics? Yeah, well, I'm a controls engineer, hint, hint. So um, of <laughs> I'm all about robot behavior. So I ride the line between electronics and software. So like a big one right with me right now, and if you look at my videos and all of my open source hardware stuff is, yeah, I like designing the robot, but what's coming next is what I'm most excited about. Can I make my robot more intelligent by writing software and adding sensors and peripherals to it so it can do things like go from mm. just moving around to avoiding an obstacle, following a wall? Can we get it to map a world? Can we get it to localize when it gets lost in the world? So building on that control architecture, that's what excites me about robots. So it's like the soup to nuts from the baby robot to maybe a three-year-old robot who has some level of intelligence. Nice. What are your favorite platforms to work with? I know that you recently published, very excited to have your Lilybot on Hackster. 
and Ooh. this one uses <laughs> it's so cute too um <laughs> And this one uses an Arduino Uno, which it does. is uh, a breakout from Seed Studio for the ice squirt scene motor, motor driver and stuff like that. Um, do you have preferred platforms to work with? Is this like... It's, it has, to be honest, it has become um, Arduino um, for a mm. couple of reasons. One of them being that um, when I got the Open Source Hardware Trailblazer Award, I was debating about Raspberry Pi and Arduino. And they like, well, you know, Arduino is really open source, but Raspberry Pi is not necessarily all open source. So that mm. sold me on it. And also because we have recently um, changed our freshman engineering courses to use Arduino. Um, these students normally will take coding courses in Python, C, Java, et cetera. Yeah. But what we have found is that Arduino is a good entry point because we want them to do electronics married with the coding. And using Arduino Sketch is a great way to introduce those who never did it in high school and get them ready for the Python and the C that are coming. We also do MATLAB. So, so even though some students call it a curse word, my second favorite <laughs> is probably MATLAB. Um, and that's because controls engineers use MATLAB a lot. Oh. But um, yeah, I, I've been doing a lot of Arduino type work because I have found with the amount of online resources and maker stuff available, I can do Arduino with a middle schooler, a college student, a grad student, and if they can't get it to me from me quickly, they can Google anything. How to play music on an Arduino, how to read a buzzer, how or how to play on a buzzer, how to read a sonar, how to read an IR. And I love that there's so much online content. Mm. You're not totally tied to your professor and have to hang off of her like a baby bird and go, <laughs> we feed me. You can go <laughs> online and find what you need. <laughs> I love this. Um, yeah. How does this? Uh, it, also, in the reinvented article, I should I should actually pull that up because it's so cool. Yeah. Um, you did your homework, honey, because I didn't even remember the reinvented article. <laughs> went deep. It's, from a, it's from a couple of years ago, uh, but yeah, you know, there, there's it's almost overwhelming the amount of stuff that uh, you've done, and so I was trying to like get a, a context on it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm old Alex. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't want to show this too much because you should go download the article, everyone, uh, or the the yeah. magazine issue. But um, just to give them a plug because I'm citing them so much, uh, you talked about how you worked on industrial robots after college. And mm -hmm. can you tell me, like, what the sort of what, what technology were you working with then? Yeah, uh, in smart factories. And do you see like what people are using now? Is it any different? Um, I think it's a little different now. Um, so I worked at Ford Motor Company Glass Division. I worked there when I was an intern in college at the Nashville Glass Division. And then once I graduated, I moved to Detroit and I worked in the River Rouge. Mm. So I think the technology is majorly different now. So at the time, I worked on KUKA robots, oh, yeah. AB robots. I also did um, Alan Bradley, Rockwell um, programming, Omicron, PLCs. So a big part of what I did in manufacturing is PLC programming. I think PLC mm -hmm. programming is absolutely still around. When I was on sabbatical, I actually worked at Eli Lilly as an automation contractor, and they still do PLC programming. What I see is the key difference in the industrial robotics now, though, is there's cobots now. And so, you know, back then when I worked with robotics, they had to be in a cage because, you know, them jokers would throw you across the room and kill you. <laughs> Right. And so uh, there, there was something called Carol programming, which is was not all that similar to any language I'd ever seen. Huh. But I think I'm kind of out of industrial robotics now. But I think one of the big things you see now in industrial robots is like um, the Sawyer robot. And oh, I can't think of the other one. But they're now a oh, Baxter, the Baxter robot, because these are now robots that don't have to necessarily be caged. They're now intelligent enough that you could actually stand beside them like a coworker, and they can work with you and they have forced feedback so that, you know, they, they know they're not going to knock you across the room. They're not in a cage anymore. And so, yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. So now you can, you can do collaborative robotics, which is cool to me because since my PhD was in human robot interaction, trying to get to the place where a human and a robot can work together on a team, like shared autonomy, as opposed to me just having to use a teach pendant and teleoperate it, I think this is the future of industrial robotics. And also it's the future kind of where we're going. You know, now that Roombas, if you think about it, are kind of ubiquitous and just chilling yeah. in everybody's house. And we got a lot of people who have um, Alexa, the AI in their house. Then the next place would be, if not a coal robot, but having people comfortable having one in their home that may be a little bit more than the box on the floor that sucks up the dirt, right? You know, yeah. you know, my vision always with my old self is to get to the point where Rosie is in that kitchen washing my dishes while I wash <laughs> it, 
right? Yeah. But if I'm going to get there, I got to be comfortable with Rosie. I got to make sure Rosie's not going to go all eye robot on me and somebody's going to hack in the system and she's going to mm. come hold me hostage in my bathroom, right? So getting people comfortable and at that level, I think that's the future of where we're going with robotics. But of yeah. course, that requires getting rid of bias because if there's bias in AI, which is what creates the controller brain on a robot, there will be bias mm. in robotics as well. Yeah. Uh, what you just said about... Um, Go away. <laughs> about them <laughs> working with humans reminds me of uh, hearing about the PR2 from yeah. Mola Garage and how they built in these controls to make it. And this is, you know, designed as an assistive robot. It's been around. Yeah. You know, this article is from 2010. But, <laughs> you know, they had these like counterweights and all these measures so that it could not apply too much force to a human. It wasn't able to like. Yeah. Have have these safe, yeah. And with industrial robots, yeah. I imagine there's more, yeah. you know, ambiguity there because they're. You need to use well, I don't know if you saw recently, you know, I live on Twitter, as you probably have noticed. Mm. Recently, there was a chess playing robot in another country. I want to say somewhere in Asia that was playing a child and the child moved too quickly out of turn. And the robot thought the child's finger was a chess piece oh, no! and, and, and broke the child's finger oh, no! because the robot gripped. And I'm responding to this article like, OK, who had this robot go live? Yeah. Know, making sure one that if it mistaked a finger for a chess piece it wouldn't immediately have that forced feedback like you just talked about with the PR2 and open yeah. up. But no, they had to come pry the robot off the child's finger and the child's finger was broken. You know, <sighs> talk about bad marketing. Whose idea was that, <laughs> right? Um, because because I think case one, no matter what I'm teaching my students in robotics, the first thing we always do is obstacle avoidance or something because I try to sneak diversity and ethics and everything I do and talk about your robot can't hurt people, mm. okay? Let's talk about Asimov's laws. That's always my first lecture as well. Number mm. one, you don't hurt humans on any level. So that buddy better not run into me. And number mm. two, he better not run off a table. Don't run my baby off a table and don't run my baby into me. Make sure your code does all of that first. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Rosie, one of your robots here. And I'm yeah. wondering you know, if, if so you've been building robots to work with you, you'd like Rosie to, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I promise you that I don't have Lily because Lily is, is in my lab at work. But here is one of my Rosie bots. So these are actually Spark Fun Inventors Kit robots. So shout out uh -huh. to them because they did sponsor these the first year that we had Black and Robotics workshops. So I want to show them some love. But yes. when I first started doing my videos, I used their robots because I have so many spare parts around my house. It was really quick to swap the robot out for whatever the topic of the next Robot Slam Poetry was. And I know you wanted one today and I am not prepared to give you that. But I can tell you that my next two will either be Sojourney Toots or huh? Malcolm Explorer. Uh, um, and I am thinking one will probably be infrared sensors and one will probably be IMU, inertial measurement units. Mm. I always try to put a topic that educates. So it's not just a cutesy um, video about robot poetry, which is cute, by the way. It is cute. But I try to sneak in something. And I started doing this because when I was doing this online, I had parents reaching out to me like, get my kid excited about STEM. Mm. I get them excited about the robot. Can we teach them a little bit while we do that? What does a sonar do? What does a servo yeah. do? What does a gripper do? So, you know, trying to show them a little bit these of these things as well. This is a, um, I believe it's a Pololu robot. I actually did a workshop with some colleagues using this one. So this is the other one that had the gripper on it that was in the other video. But um, yeah, I think no one is ever too old to learn. So I try to make my content. So if you're an elementary kid who wants to do it, great. But if you're 99 and you want to learn some about robot, great for you as well. That's my husband's hat. I yeah. just, and that's me sitting in this very seat. I just grabbed whatever's around me while I was in the house. It was a busy, crazy summer, you know, you know, the, 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 the worst thing they can do is let me out the classroom because I go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> how has it been actually with uh, the whole, you know, COVID situation? Do you feel like, how, how have you adjusted to teaching? Uh, is it more hybrid? Is everything in person still yeah, for you? Yeah. Or? We're back to in person now. <laughs> that means less of my content flowing out the door. You know, when I'm mm -hmm. in my house, I can take it. I can turn off the Zoom and go and grab this stuff. But now that we're back in class full time, I'm generating less content and I miss it. You know, I never thought I would miss being so creative. I had taught online before. I had taught math online when I was a grad student mm. and I had taught online in the summertime. So unlike some of my other colleagues, some of those more seasoned saints, as I like to say, yeah. 
when the pandemic struck, I already knew how to use the LMS. I already knew how to post things online. I already knew how to make videos. So I just came home and just turned on my ring light. Some of my colleagues, we had to sit down with them and, you know, help them to breathe mm -hmm. and show them how to use the learning management system, show them how to make online videos. And I was just like, hey, click go. I'm ready to go because I know you're not going to believe this, Alex, but I'm an introverted heart. So working <laughs> out of my house, that's that's a blessing to me. This is my ministry over here. That's Going good. into work is where I have to kind of and scene. Good yeah. morning, everyone. Because you know, I, I get drained with all that. I, I would love to come back in my house full time, but no. My school is most likely not going to be going back online because our students don't like to learn online. Uh. And engineering, I'll be honest, engineering is hard online because especially my department, most of our classes have a lab. Everything's hands-on. Um, circuits lab, you know, learning to breadboard and solder and all that kind of stuff when you're at home is hard because my school had to ship kits to the students. You have to look at the Zoom and have them point it down at their computer mm -hmm. with their cell phone to try to I figure out why their this. breadboard is not wired right. It's a pain. It is. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, are there anything, are there any tips that you would give people who are teaching online to make that easier? Um, for me, and I know this is hard because everyone doesn't have my personality, yeah. try to be as engaging as possible. Um, when I first went online, my seniors were the worst because they knew their graduation had been stolen from them. So when right. that class I had with them, they were just like mice. They did not want to mm -hmm. talk. They were grumpy. So I started doing things like ad hoc quizzes that were things like, how are you feeling today with a straight face, a smiley face, and a sad face? Not to be surprised, most of it was sad face. Uh -huh. um, we started doing um, sing-alongs to start the beginning of the week. I didn't care uh -huh. if anybody joined in or not. We had Bruno Mars week, so I would do Uptown Funk. Uh -huh. And, but I was like, I don't want this. If we're going to teach online, this doesn't have to look like how you expect a Zoom class to be online. Yeah, I'm looking at a screen of squares because nobody wants to turn their camera on or make a profile picture. But I'm still going to uptown funk to that screen, of square, <laughs> that screen of squares. And interestingly, by the end of that quarter, I had a student who logged on and he did an a acoustic guitar redemption of one of the songs I had sung. I had another young lady who said her little sister came in and was dancing around the room while I sang. So oh, you don't so ever, you don't always know how what you're doing is going to affect people, but try to make your your Zoom lectures not the stale sage on the stage that you are in the classroom. But I'll be honest, I do the same thing in class. So what am I saying? I just did it on a camera instead of doing it in front of the room. I've heard my my jokes are corny. Um, I'm very, <laughs> Great. I'm very sarcastic. I do cap on people in class. I've heard that's not cool. You know, the esteemed professor doesn't do that. And I'm like, well, I do it because I get bored hearing my voice. Mm. So if I can crack me up, at least one person in the room is laughing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And you can you can tell so much when someone's having fun doing what they're doing. Oh, mm -hmm. man, uh, it sounds really inspiring. And uh, mm -hmm. speaking of inspiration, you're talking about um, wanting to share like your inspirations for Lilybot. And maybe yeah, about. so so Lilybot, my, my biggest thing other than the Arduino Uno is I wanted to make Lilybot as open as possible. God, I wish I had Lilybot with me. Um, you have oh, a picture. So, <laughs> yeah. So I wanted it to be so if you look at Lilybot from any side, you can see what's going on. Like mm. you can see her battery pack. You can see her battery. You can see her motors. You can see her wheels. Because I have sometimes taught with robots, you know, being I've been teaching mobile robotics since 2007, 15 years. I went through about five platforms. And some of the frustrations with it was when I bought a, a off the shelf robot and things went wrong, we sometimes couldn't get to the innards. I didn't know what was going yeah. on. I didn't know how it had been developed. Or I taught with a robot where they gave us libraries. The problem with the libraries is once again, when things went wrong, or if it said, plug this into pin three and read the sonar. Okay, I plugged it in pin three, I can't read the sonar and I can't get inside your software. I don't know yeah. what's going on. It's a selling point of the open source so software and the open source hardware. So I wanted to be able to, from soup to nuts, show every single thing I did to build and get this robot working. So at any moment you could go, oh, that wire's in the wrong spot. Oh, that pin is wrong or anything about that. So that was my whole thing with Lilybot. I wanted Lilybot to be a circle because one of the challenges that we have with my students is when we first start doing odometry or dead reckoning or uh -huh. driving the robot around is this student says the X direction is the front of the robot. This student says the Y direction is the front of I'm making a circle. <laughs> Especially when and you're if you're like, driving forward, that's your X. And I don't want to hear it. 
you know, because it would drive us crazy. Because I'd say, drive the robot to one foot, one foot in the world. Half the robots were going left. Half the robots were going right. I'm making a circle. <laughs> and if I tell you straight ahead, and if you notice, I put a lot of um, labels on Lilybot. Um, so mm. batteries, Uno. You can't see it because they're covered it. here. But if you could find, I don't know if I have any in here. Well, where it's example, not covered. Like, there's even just a Lilybot. There we go. Sort of I have front, back. Oh, left. yeah. Right. Because it's those little things that people don't realize are so important. Right. And so even when you're putting the robot together, I want everything to just be transparent mm -hmm. so that if your mom or dad who doesn't do technology, helping a 12 year old, you got it. Or if you're an adult doing it and, you know, you're, you're directionally challenged, you got it, too. But yeah, so Lilybot is it's my baby bot. And I am waiting for that Prusa large 3D printer to finally come out mm. because I also want to make Rosie bot. Get it? Rosie and Lily flower bots. Uh, but um, Rosie is also the school mascot at Rose Holman. So Rosie is our uh, elephant. Um, we're the Rose Holman engineers. So Rosie bot was actually first. I had Rosie bot completely designed. And because I had never used a 3D printer before, went to print it and found out the doggone thing was too big for the printer. Um, so I just found out that the Prusa 3D XL is supposed to be coming out later this fall. So once the Prusa, mm. X, you are so good about finding stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Rosie. Rosie go the 3D printer now. <laughs> so once the Prusa XD comes out, I'm going to make Rosie bot. And my goal eventually, and hopefully I'll get there by May, is to have Rosie bot and Lily bot collaboratively work together Ooh. so if they can map together or if they can can move in tandem like swarming or flocking that would be kind of the culmination of what i hope to do as part of the open source hardware trailblazer because i want to be able to show i took these robots from from outreach service level for children college level mobile robotics type concepts all the way through some research level type work Mm. Um, that was, that's a major leap, but that's kind of where I wanted to go with this. Yeah. And your research is on, uh, human robot interaction and interface yeah. design. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so my PhD was on designing a way to improve a interface where people remotely, um, engage with a robot. So it's called mm. a sensory ego sphere, which basically ego is yourself. So you put the robot at the center of a sphere that has all of the data that the robot needs to make decisions. So sonar data key objects in the world, um, infrared, et cetera. And then this database of the robot's knowledge is used to help the robot drive around. And what we wanted to see is that if I put something on my robot and then I put the robot in, let's say a whole nother room where you can't see it, how easy is it for you to figure out where the robot is, figure out how to drive the robot, mm -hmm. make decisions about what the robot should do next. If the robot is stuck, knowing when to step in. So can you take, God, you are so good. Take, can you take the robot? <laughs> can you take the robot from, um, like we talked about a baby to remote control, which is not very intelligent, all the way to fully autonomous? Mm. Or can I use this ego sphere to, to help the robot make those kind of decisions? That's so cool. what I want to eventually get with my students, and I'm not there yet. My school is primarily undergraduate, science, engineering, math, but we don't have PhD students. And uh, most of our master students are course-based is I want to replicate the sensory ego sphere on any type of robot. So that, that's mm. always been my dream. I haven't made it there yet, where I did it on a Pioneer 3DX robot. And I do have one of those, and that's a research level robot. But one of the selling points of open source hardware is I'm not at Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Georgia Tech, Stanford. I don't have startup funds, and I don't have a big budget like that. So what if I can uh, make an interface to remotely control my lily bots? or my Rosie bots. And then mm -hmm. can I remotely take that interface if I build it in MATLAB or processing or some open source type language? And can I make that interface more intelligent so that I can now deploy my Lily bot somewhere and I'm back here at my house making sure that they're doing what they're doing. Think about the Mars Rover. You know, I'm here on earth yeah. and that Rover is up there looking for water or soil or analyzing rocks. And you now may have a time delay, you may have bandwidth issues, et cetera. But can I make good decisions just with my computer screen, knowing the robot is somewhere else? Yeah, it it reminds me a lot of um, trying to work on telepresence robots. So for yes. you know sending a robot to a conference when I can't go, yeah. you know, I've I've been at a conference that had a telepresence robot before. It was really cool. The HRI conference. Yeah. What did you think of it? 
I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Although I will be honest, mm. it does creep you out a little bit when you're just <laughs> talking and this robot slides up in the middle and there's somebody on the screen like, hey, uh, I'm here. He's like, mm. hi. Ah. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of like you feel like you're being spied on. I mean, after a couple of days, you're used to it. But when you first like, um, there's somebody in the middle of us. <laughs> yeah, know? that's really interesting. Uh, I've been wanting to build some in the in the shape of like animals, like Archimedes the owl. Oh, that's like, cool. Make... That's cute, right? I feel like it would be less creepy and like more engaging. Like, oh, this is a creature that I'm like a being, and you know, it might still maybe it'll be even more creepy because you think. Well, that you it know, was that's the uncanny valley thing, right? Yeah, um, I know you've seen the robot where you try to touch his nose, and he's like, ugh, you know, just <laughs> creeping you out. So I think any kind of anthropomorphic um, mm. figure they can take that makes them a little bit more easy for people to accept, I think mm -hmm. is good, yeah. as long as you make them aware that it is still a robot, right? That's not a stuffed animal over there. There's still, yeah. you know, a camera there and a person. Oh my gosh. Engaging. I'm imagining like a, a like a teddy bear or something, and yeah. it suddenly comes to life, and you're like, ah! <laughs> that'd be so terrifying, especially if it's on like a right. stick. I think it's cute know. though. It's kind of like you know talking about marrying the arts with STEM. I think that's mm. another way to bring more people in. I was doing a radio show where a man called in and said, "I would love to get my daughter into STEM, but she's really into fabric arts." And my daughter, who you can imagine, has been coding and doing robotics since she was three. Yeah, has now decided she wants to be an artist. So the, my new thing now is I got to be able to show that just because I have an artistic bone in my body doesn't mean you're totally disconnected from STEM. Yeah. You marry those together, you make your steam and you make you some wearable electronics, right? Mm. Or you make you a, a glow in the dark dress by threading some LED strips at the bottom of your skirt. But you're not out the running just because art is your new jam. Mm. We figure out how you could do that with your STEM. Yeah, uh, I'm really curious just to take us uh, rewind for a second. Uh, mm -hmm talking about human robot interaction. And you also talked about wanting Rosie and Lily to be able to interact with each other. Yeah. What do you think is, so, you know, are the differences between uh, human robot interaction and robot robot interaction? Is it different when you can sort of program both sides to work together? I think the biggest challenge is sometimes finding ways for the robots to communicate with each other in a way um, that they can understand, right? right? So there's lots of wireless communication. Um, and then once again, being budget limited, right? Mm. So I have to do this with technologies that we can afford to do. Um, there's Bluetooth, there's Zigbee, um, there's wireless transceivers. So there are some ways that currently exist for robots to communicate with each other, but then they may be limited also in what they can do. So we also have used pixie cameras in my class before, mm. but right now the pixie cameras are kind of limited basically to finding colors, right? Which is great. But anything where you have to do any higher level of image processing is once again, going to slow the robot down because you now got to put that intelligence for doing image processing on it or computer vision. And then if you have a robot that's moving, so mm. you think, they're communicating, but they're also moving in the world. By the time all that calculation happens and maybe gets back to the user or the other robot, the robot may not even be there anymore, right? Mm. So you may the robot may say, hey, I see a dog. And the other robot goes, okay, good. I'm the cat. I'm going after the dog. And the robot, the second robot gets there and goes, there ain't no dog here. <laughs> so I'm not there anymore. I mean, you know, so the, the biggest challenge I think is in that time delay, making sure it's relevant data that the robot or the person is still acting on. Mm. And when it's robot to robot, finding a way for them to communicate that makes sense so that it's rich enough for you to get the data that you need. I think oh. swarming and flocking is a good first step because that's really just a matter of something is here or not here. Um, one thing you have to think about though is in a, in a, in a room, mobile robots moving around distance is going to just be, I see something. You got to have a way to confirm that something it sees is actually another robot. Mm. I don't know if you saw the create robots that I had put online um, on my TikTok a couple of weeks ago, but that was a challenge when we first started. And I had a student working on that because we were using infrared sensors. So it saw a wall as the robot. So we had to figure out a way for it to follow a robot and not the wall and the first robot to follow the wall because all it knows is thing or not thing. It doesn't know what that thing is unless you can add some other sensors to increase the intelligence. Is it just being lazy? Like if I were a robot, I feel like it'd be a lot easier to follow a wall. <laughs> it's just like sitting there. That's where we always start. If you scroll down a little bit on this page, uh -huh. um, it, it may not be too far down. I don't go too crazy. Okay, um, down. Okay, I lied. Keep Ooh. going. Oh, there it is. That one where the student is looking up at the screen. Oh, no, it's making you do the puzzle. Um, this one right here where the student's looking him right here. Yeah. So he, his goal was 
He first just took the create robot and we always start there and you have to make the robot follow a wall. Once the robot follows a wall, the next step is, can you make robots follow each other? Mm. And the second one is actually following the wall instead of following, um, <laughs> following the robot instead of following the wall. The reason this is a good first step is because this is a basic level of controls. Like I said, I'm a controls engineer. And you can use proportional control to make robots follow a wall. So this doesn't seem very impressive, but that's not a Roomba. That's a robot that had zero intelligence. So mm. it didn't do anything really. So he had to write the software so that it would recognize a wall. But what I was telling you, Alex, is since it uses an infrared sensor, if you walked up next to that robot, mm -hmm. all it would see is Alex has legs, but that's <laughs> also a thing. And it would try to follow your legs, uh -huh. right? Because all an infrared sensor says is, Object or not object. If you scroll down a little bit more or up, somewhere in here, there's also a video of the two robots following each other. I don't know. We may have lost that one. Maybe it's not in here. But um, that's a good stuff, though. But these are th that's where I always begin. Yeah. There it is. So as a controls engineer, yeah, that's where we start. So now that second robot knows nothing about wall following. What it knows is I need to follow the thing that's in front of me. So now it's also following a wall, but it's really following that robot. And, and so these are how we begin. And this is the beginning of swarming and flocking. So he, so this student finished his research on Friday, but then the next step would be that we have five or six of these robots. Can we have them move like a swarm of birds, right? Mm. Can, can they all flock together? And then what would be the benefit of doing that? Maybe they're going to explore an unknown territory where a team of them is more efficient than one because now five of them can cover that space quicker. They can bring back information to the users faster, et cetera. Then next level up, because I'm into human robot interaction is, can I make an interface on my computer to control that team of robots if I'm nowhere near it mm -hmm. and make it work the way it needs to work? Make the five or six of them come together and collaboratively work together. I recently learned about the Robotarium at Georgia cool. Tech. Somebody reached out to me from there where he said there is a way to remotely log in and have their remote robots mm -hmm. do swarming and flocking. I haven't had a chance to go play with it yet, but there is a lab at Georgia Tech that any user can log into. Thank you for finding that. But any user can log into this website and cool. you can have their real robots huh. execute your code and do swarming, flocking, et cetera. It's really cool. Huh. Yeah. Um, I was curious on this last one. Um, where did it go? TikTok. Ah, you got sixty tabs open out. Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Always. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, the cardboard bumper on the front one here. Is that to make it more reflective? Is it? To That's exactly. So, so the old Create robots. This is their their third generation. Were white. And so when we would do this stuff, we just turned it on and it just worked. Yeah. When we first started, my student couldn't figure out what the problem was. And I totally forgot, and this is a professor brain fart. It was totally on Ugh. me. Infrared does not do well with a black color. Infrared absorbs black. So we had to put the cardboard on it to reflect. Ugh. And that was totally on me. I forgot about it. And it's so funny because his, his mom was, was watching our stuff on social media <laughs> and fussed at him about how tacky it looks. So I think he's now changed it over to maybe <laughs> some white index cards or something, but I don't oh, know. Yeah. But you know, she, she was just like, I don't like the way it looks. I was like, hey, <laughs> when you're doing research, you're not about cute. But his mom said she thought the cardboard looked tacky. So. so I think that's hilarious. But also I can imagine being a student and having my parents be able to see what I'm doing. Like <laughs> at the school work online. Nightmare. Yeah. Absolutely. She called him um, one day after they, because Rose Holman had retweeted uh -huh. some of my robot videos. And his mom called him and was like, uh, I don't like the way that looks. And he's like, mom, please get off social media. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I'm having flashbacks. My parents are both teachers and like my, my dad taught in the same place that I went to high school. Yeah. And he would always have lunch with my teachers and they like always knew when I was behind on stuff like, no! Hated it. Yeah, my, my daughter just started high school and my husband went up to her principal and said, you know, I think I'd like to finish out with my daughter. You have any openings here? Like, we, we may in January. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's great, but it's also terrifying. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, so you 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 clearly uh, you mentioned in the article, especially that you um, have been introducing your daughter to technology. You said since yeah. she was three years old. Uh, and it wasn't on purpose. It's because you know my husband had to work, so she just had to come to work with me. 
Mm -hmm. So I have videos of her actually with the white create robots, like the black one in the video you just showed mm -hmm. doing like obstacle avoidance in a big wow. green with about 10 of them. And she's in the middle of it. And, I, you know, remote control driving oh. another robot. So it oh. wasn't like I was trying to force it down her throat. It was just, I got to go to work and you got to come because I don't have a babysitter. Mm -hmm. And so she's now done Vex Robotics. She's done first Lego league. I was the coach of her teams. Um, she's done Vex at her school. She's done coding. And I think I just went down her throat too much because now she's like, I want to be an artist. Oh, really? yeah. you can have multiple interests though, right? You can. Like you were saying, you uh... she can do it yeah. and she's good at it, you know. And I now mm -hmm. recently found out now in high school, you have to plan your kid's schedule. I thought that's what guidance counselors used to do. So of no. course, I'm going to put her in all the advanced math and science classes mm -hmm. because if she ever changes her mind and wants to go back or wants to marry her art with her STEM, I want her to be prepared to do that. She can take her mm -hmm. art classes, but we still going to go to calculus. <laughs> you know are there so, any are there any parts of it that you thought uh, of like her uh, education that you thought were especially cool things that people worked in i actually used to get excited when she was learning something that i taught like last mm. year she was in eighth grade and they she came home and said to me i don't understand this series and parallel stuff oh honey <laughs> you ain't said nothing but a word thunderbird and so i made kitchen table circuits one of them used to be pinned to my tiktok but i don't think it's there anymore mm. one day at dinner she said i don't understand this series and parallel circuit i took out my cell phone i got some plastic spoons knives and forks and said this is a node this is what series looks like this is what parallel looks like and i called it kitchen table circuit so i get mm. excited when she's learning things that i teach because unlike most kids, because somebody was like, she actually will listen to you. I was like, yeah, she does. My daughter actually will listen when I tell her I used to teach calculus and algebra and geometry. So she'll come to me for help on her homework. I've heard at some point around this age is when they start thinking parents are dumb and know nothing. Mm -hmm. She's not quite there yet. So um, the first year of the pandemic, when I was on sabbatical, um, she was homeschooled because only child, mommy wasn't ready for her to go back. She wasn't ready to go back. So I taught her pre-algebra. And so then mm. all of my complaining about the way she was being taught math went out the window <laughs> because since she was learning from a computer, I taught her that. Uh -huh. And my biggest level of pride is when she went back to school, they had said some of the homeschool kids during the first year of the pandemic were going to have to go back. They didn't learn their math. And I said, oh, no, not this one. Mm. I taught her. She's good to go. Put her in algebra, please. <laughs> Solid. Uh we talked about your dissertation a while ago. And actually, mm -hmm. oh, let's just sneak in this question here from Ella, who's a really cool member of the community. Uh, what is the importance of PhD to you? What does it add to your experience as an engineer with a beautiful enthusiasm and amazing heart? So for me, I hate to say it. I know it's not right, but that credential mm -hmm. adds something when I walk in a room. Um, there's not a lot of me. The most recent article that came out talked about, especially PhDs in engineering schools, um, probably women, black women, there may be less than 200 or so. And you still get questioned. You still get your credentials questioned. Mm -hmm. You still get your knowledge questioned. I teach at a school that was, that is still predominantly white male. Um, and I interact with some people who've never had to have a person of color as the person of authority in a classroom. So getting called miss a lot and having to go, no, it's doctor. <sighs> Just like you call those men, doctor, baby, call me doctor. Mm -hmm. Or having students who will ask questions about, um, I don't think that equation is right. I don't think that derivation is correct. So sometimes for me, what? my PhD doesn't add anything because I know I was awesome before. Mm -hmm. But being able to move in those spaces and at least shutting some of them up and having them listen and go, dang, she does know what she's talking about. <laughs> One of the things that happened to me that really galled me when I first got to my first school. Mm -hmm. And this guy was like, I want to say he graduated with, with a 4.0. Is he would come to me after class every day with on a post-it note where he had scribbled things that I could improve about my lack. Oh, no, the audacity. What he did not realize is, although I was new to that university, mm. I had been teaching for three years at another university before I came. But his assumption when he looked at me was, she's green, she's new, oh, she she's needs not my knowledgeable, knowledge. I need to help her, mm. right? So to, to, so to think about to be well actually by an 18 or 19 year old, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, like, so, so what my PhD means to me is I can be a role model and mentor to people that
that go, I didn't know I could get where you are. I didn't know I could do what you, you do. And when I see you, I know that I can do it. But I don't ever want anyone to think that if you don't have a PhD and you don't have the resources to get there, that you cannot be just as impactful. My background tells me I can never look down on anybody because I'm only here by the grace of God. Right. Um, I haven't told you much about my academics at Georgia Tech or about, you know, my grades and that, you know, I was a thank you, Lordy, not a cum Lordy. So, um, you know, I, I can never look down on anyone. But what my PhD means to me is that I'm a unicorn and I'm a rarity and I'm trying to make it so that we're not unicorns forever. Mm. I hope that helps. Um, Allah. I hope I'm saying your name right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, just to make sure that we mention, uh, you do have these uh, organizations, Black in Robotics yeah. and Black in Engineering. And can you tell us a little bit about your um, what these organizations absolutely. do? So um, during summer of 2020, and actually around May, ar around the time that George Floyd was murdered, um, Black in the Ivory started trending on Twitter. And then um, it was called like kind of the birth of the Black and X movement. So Black and STEM already existed. Vanguard STEM already existed, but then Christian Cooper was a black bird watcher who was racially profiled in Central Park, where he tried to ask a woman to leash her dog because she was disturbing the birds. And instead of doing that, she got mad and called the cops on him or yeah, and he videotaped it and it went viral. And so that was the birth of Black Birders Week. And it was a week that they had started out of support for him. And then people got so excited about seeing black academics online <clears throat> that all these all these organizations were born. And so Black and Engineering wanted to get in on the fun. So me and Dr. Monica Cox and Dr. Tahira Reed, who are professors at Ohio State and Purdue in engineering, we, we, we called on our colleagues that we all had, were on a listserv together and said we wanted to start Black and Engineering. And Black and Engineering was started as a call for fairness um, in the academy. And so one of the things we had is that it's called action steps, that green button action steps is a call to action for becoming an anti-racist university where we shared not only some of the experiences that black and brown academics, particularly in STEM go through, but things that a university can do to be anti-racist and more inclusive. And so out of that also grew Black and Robotics. Black and Robotics was, was started in September of 2020. <clears throat> and this was a way to connect with allies and also thinking about the AI and the bias. So we wanted our mission to be have, including more black and brown people in the room for community advocacy, accountability. A big thing that happened last year at the beginning of the year was when they had the um, Boston Dynamics DigiDog was with some, they sell those to police departments mm -hmm. and the dog was escorting the police into a, a hostage situation in New York. And there was a public outcry because although that robot was remote controlled by its handler, the concern becomes what if we, they start using these robots in any kind of autonomous fashion? Yep. Or what if these robots are, are, are given a weapon in any kind of fashion? And now we have the bias that black and brown people mm -hmm. experience um, in criminal justice being used on a robot. So and interestingly enough, I was on a podcast around that time and somebody had asked me about, should robots kill people? And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> Ask Miles Laws. Mm. And I mentioned that. And somebody from the company, um, Boston Dynamics, reached out to me. So let me just say a disclaimer that when I say things, I'm not saying that, you know, their dogs are killing people or outfitted with weapons. We're just talking about things that could possibly happen that people are afraid of. Happening. For sure. And, you know, I think that as you mentioned, they have uh, Boston Dynamics themselves have uh, made a pledge not to put weapons on, but that doesn't mean Absolutely. that they're running. We've seen other ones that are very similar that other people are taking these same ideas on social media. Some of that stuff is CGI, and I'll be honest, I don't mm. always know CGI from real. So there were two that's that perfect. I saw on TikTok that I reacted to, and somebody said, That's not real, that's computer graphics. Well, I don't always know that. Also, and people think, are inspired by that stuff, you know, right? And I think the one that came out recently that I saw. I don't think that one is. I don't think it's here. I think it might have been in China or somewhere, but I don't think that one was computer graphic. But the whole point is whether it's real or not, we don't want to see our robots shooting at mm. people and other robots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's just not our thing. No, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned uh, not wanting to see them shoot at other robots too. And you've mentioned uh, Asimov's three laws of robotics a couple of times now. If you could create a, you know, a fourth law, like there is the one, actually. Law, oh, I said, there's a fourth law now. It's called the zeroth law. I actually mm -hmm. talked about this in a talk last week. 
And it builds on those others that a robot should not harm humanity. Um, that's a zero flaw. Yeah. And somebody asked me, how is that different from the robot should not harm humans? And the, so what I say this is great. that one law to me, me now means, um, yeah, the zero flaw. And so oh, what that means to me is that um, thinking beyond just another person, the robot should not be actively engaged in building a nuclear bomb or, mm -hmm. or, or something that could kill humanity. So that's now the fourth law. Um is it goes beyond the robot should not kill humans. It should not hurt itself. It should not cause by inaction to cause a human to, I, I, I think that, so we're trying to cover it all. So that's what that zero or that fourth law is for. That's a good question though. Cause I, mm -hmm. when I first started teaching robotics, I didn't know about that fourth law either. Um, it may have been a, I learned from my students as much as they learned from me. Mm -hmm. And it may have been a student who mentioned that to me. That's so cool. I love this interplay between you and the students. Um, they're my babies. They get on my nerves sometimes, but they're also my babies. In fact, I have some of them who are like, you're like my mama. You're like my auntie. No, I ain't. I'm, you're not my child. Go home. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, especially being an introvert, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, the one in that TikTok video you just showed, he's one of those who's always like, you know, you're oh. like my mama on campus. I'm not your mama. <laughs> but I'll fuss at you like I'm your mama when you're not doing what I'm asking you to do, though. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also on your TikTok, you mentioned, but we're, we're getting to the end here, but we got to talk about your books. Uh, so, A. I forgot to bring my book. My book's in the other room. But anywho, um, you can show here. So, so one of my books I wrote because I teach undergraduate students. They're juniors and seniors. Every robotics book I found was either really low level, like Legos for K through 12, or so advanced that I could barely understand it. Right. So I wrote this book out of my lecture notes because I needed to find a book to teach robotics at the level that college students could understand. Mm. So it's not very long, it's not very complicated, but it hits at just the right level so my students could get it, right? Um, so that's what this is. I do now have an advanced robotics course that is taught um, based upon the content at probabilisticrobotics.org by Sebastian Thrun. And so that's a more high level course for students who are going on to graduate school. But um, my mobile robotics course, um, that book is for my mobile robotics course. I actually have a whole website with all the lectures and the videos nice. and all that. And people really seem to like that content um, because I think it hits right at that level. I need it. When I was at Georgia Tech and took a robotics course, the robots were so expensive and so high level, we could write the code, we could talk about it, and we couldn't touch it. I was like, hands-on learning is a thing. Active learning is a thing. So if I ever teach robotics, which is what I said when I was in undergrad with my 2.5 GPA, I want to teach a class where students can manipulate and touch the robot. My mechanical engineering students are the worst. I'll come back after Christmas. They got lights on the robot. They got, um, you know, Christmas stuff hanging off of it. But they will trick out my robot in a minute. There are some opportunities that you miss out on when you tell students, stand behind the cage, I'll run your code and look at you, look at the robot, as opposed to here's a screwdriver, here's some tape, there's a breadboard, build me a better robot. Mm. There's some things that happens there. It's more of that creativity overlapping. Absolutely. With Absolutely. And so, you know, I, you know, I, as excited as I was to take robotics as an undergrad, I would be more excited to take my class. Nice. Oh, right. that's the robot goes home with you. Right. It's the ideal, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, create what you what you wish you had had. Yeah. And then you also have another book. This one is new. <laughs> <laughs> I'm silly, Alex. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, along with my colleagues I mentioned earlier at Black and Engineering and Tequila Harris at Georgia Tech, we talked about that engineering has a marketing problem. So one way to really help make engineering more normalized and so for people to see us as other than unicorns is how about fictional books about black women in, in STEM, black women in science, technology, engineering, and math. My jam is romance novels. So mm -hmm. if I was going to write a fictional book, I could have did sci-fi and ha made her a MacGyver of robotics. No, I want her to do romance. I want to show her finding love, honey, being I, you know, it's obviously, you know, I'm a professor of engineering. I have to be refined. Mm. So my book is not erotica at all. <laughs> it's a straight up Harlequin romance, 
not um, Fifty Shades of Grey romance, okay? Mm -hmm. Because my students have already found it. In fact, I was <laughs> writing the book and had students come up to me, Dr. Barry, are you writing a romance novel? <laughs> yes, darlings, I am. And you can read it. In fact, some people have bought my book for their high school students even. Ah. So that's how clean it is. But <laughs> I wanted to be able to show um, Black women in particular doing STEM and living their lives. You know, the challenges of work-life balance. What does it mean to be a grad student in robotics and have a professor tell you, I need you to um, spend more time in the lab, get off social media, stop the distractions with your new ro um, romantic interest and get back in here and code my robot. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to say, I'm a mom, I'm a sister, um, I'm a daughter, but I'm still a STEM superstar. My fictional books are called um, First Responder Fairy Tales. But what I like to say is even though there's a fireman in my first book, the Black women in STEM are the first responder fairy tales. Engineers design the solutions to problems in the world. Why can't I also be considered a first responder? Mm. Yeah, all everything that's on a fire truck was, was designed by engineers. Uh, hey, thank you. <laughs> so, so Reese is my romantic interest. He's the mm. firefighter who rescues Monet from the elevator on her way to her dream job internship interview when the power goes out and the elevator goes down. When you read my books, there's always some nuggets of truth there. I have been stuck on an elevator when the power went out. Uh, okay. Did you did you meet any cool firefighters or is this me? No! In fact, I was on there by, I was on there by myself. And when they took too long coming, I pried the door open and I was halfway up to the next floor. So nice. I climbed up onto the floor. And when I got to the bottom, the firefighters down there actually blessed me out and said, ma'am, the power could have started back at any moment. You could have plunged to your death. Why did you do that? You were taking too long. And I was sitting up in that, no more by myself. Yeah, badass. That's amazing. I mean, I get that, like, I get their response, like being the people who are like supposed to protect. That's amazing. That's so cool. I did. I was in my 20s. I was silly and I wasn't thinking straight. I probably wouldn't do it now, but I mean, you know, at the at the time I was like, I want to get out of here. It's been five minutes. Seriously. <laughs> you got places to be. I got places to be. Mm. So speaking of which, uh, honestly, I could be here for so much longer chatting about so much that you've done, but um, yeah, everyone check out the links in the description below. Yeah. Uh, we've got norsteminus.com. We've got your, I didn't even get all of these in the description, honestly. I'm going to have to go back and, and edit these, but um, you know, your TikTok, your Twitter, uh, Instagram, Hackster now. Go check out the Lily Yay. bot. Um, Yay. And I, I'm going to put up my next Hackster. It's going to be obstacle avoidance. Um, oh, yeah. I got to get back to campus next week and get Lily's sonar fixed up. And um, the next project will hopefully go up in the next week cool yeah and uh more on youtube including those uh the robot slam poetries they're so good ah, especially with like i do love how you introduce like a different component in each one of those and you're talking about doing some more of those in the future love it black in robotics.org uh black in engineering.org yeah. and of course just so many other things you can find uh publications on the web. thank you for having me this has been so much fun thank you for joining thank you so much Thank, Thank you, you everyone for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week and hack on. Hack on!